Okay, hello everybody. My name is Tristan, and I just am one of the people who actually helped to organize this uh, this event here tonight. So uh, I want to welcome everyone and uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. I mean, uh, me, uh, Drew Garvey, who isn't here right now, but uh, he played a major role in getting this together, and a whole gang of other people who worked pretty hard to get this event organized. Uh, to bring Michael Parenti, um, our guest speaker here to Guelph. So uh, you know, while you people could be anywhere in the world, you're here with us, and we do appreciate that. Yeah. So uh, Michael Parenti is a major author. He's written over 20 books. He's a real veteran of activism, progressive causes, and radical politics extending back to the 1960s. He has made countless guest, guest uh, appearances on TV and radio programs over the years, including our very own Back in USSR Rebel Music Show uh, on CFRU 93.3 FM, which you all should tune into, by the way. It's on Saturdays at, 9, at 10 p.m. <laughs> it's like local here. So, um, and he has lectured on just about, well, every conceivable subject in politics, economics, social issues, cultural issues, you name it. So, uh, and I, get, I think I'll stop that part of it now just because uh, I think he gets this spiel every time he speaks anywhere and it must get very boring. <laughs> but, it's but, right, it's right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Okay. But the, uh, the topic tonight is um, the subject of Michael's latest book. It's called The Face of Imperialism. And I thought, you know, what better way to introduce this talk to you and really try to bring it home to you uh, just how much imperialism has impacted on us, like in the past, and continues to have impact on us today. Um, like all around the world, is to talk about the experiences of my own family. So the most logical start, place to start when it comes to my family would be the historical event in the early 19th century known innocuously as the Irish Potato Famine, during which Ireland bled almost one half of its population through starvation, disease, refugee flows, and British bullets. Mainstream history calls it a simple famine, but like so many famines in history, it would never have gotten as bad without a little help from imperialism. Consider how the British Empire made no move to enact a serious famine relief effort. It flooded Ireland with its soldiers. It continued to forcibly export Irish grain, even as huge sections of the population were starving to death. It ruthlessly crushed any dissent, and it made no secret about its desire to see the Irish population eliminated in order to make way for waves of English settlers. Like so many Irish families, the Deneens were forced to flee their homeland and lost over half of their number in the process to disease and squalor aboard overcrowded sailing ships. We came to Canada as refugees from one of the most brutal episodes of economic exploitation in history but we survived. 160 years after the British Empire tried to destroy us, we are still here. But see, that isn't the only example. See, being in the heartland of the empire doesn't spare you from being on the receiving end of imperialism, as the British branch of my family discovered. Imperialism is not something that happens just overseas or over there. The Laybourns lost their land, and like so many people did in the 18th century, they were driven from their homes by landowners, bent on maximizing profits and enclosing by force as much land and resources as possible for their own exclusive use. And that's the process that Marx called primitive accumulation. And I'm sure like many people in this room, if you are from like a English uh, background at all, if you look back far enough in your, uh, your history, you will find traces of this in your past as well. And for 150 years after that, after they lost their land, lost their livelihood, they worked as coal miners in northern England. For 150 years, they lived without running water, without sanitation, without electricity, even though long after it was available, health care, access to education or occupational safety. They had none of that. So in the heart of the richest and most powerful country in the world at the time, the British Empire, of course, was, was reigning. It had like colonies in every continent. Most powerful country in the world. Whole families would die of tuberculosis in this town. The black lung, breathing too much coal dust, would kill most miners before they hit 40. Cave-ins, gas explosions, mechanical, favors, uh, mechanical failures, and a thousand other hazards were part of daily life. And things would actually not improve after, until after the Second World War, when the British Empire was in a state of terminal decline. What does that say? See, the empire needed us. It needed our coal. The coal that lit the arms factories and that powered the battleships that allowed Britannia to rule the waves. 
and project imperial power onto every continent. In the Second World War, my own granddad was conscripted and shipped out to Burma, a, colonial, a remote colonial outpost he had never even heard of, to fight against the Japanese, which of course were Britain's imperial rivals at the time. And uneducated as he was, I think he understood imperialism better than most people in this room, just from firsthand experience. When after seeing the horrendous conditions in his hometown, after seeing his comrades in arms die on a foreign field, halfway around the world, he said to the British officer who tried to pin a medal to his chest, beg your pardon, sir, but shove it up your ass. <laughs> By the way, you don't hear stories about that on Remembrance Day, <laughs> officially. <laughs> So no one should be surprised when I identify with those people in Libya, or those people in Iraq, or those people in Yugoslavia, or Vietnam, or in too many other places where the American empire has intervened to bring sorrow, tears, and blood in the name of power and profit. No one should be surprised that I feel solidarity with those who stand up and fight back, past and present. And no one should be surprised when I organize events like this that emphasize why imperialism from then to now must be opposed. And with that, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Michael Parenti. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to talk about this U.S. empire. Um, it's, it's, it's an empire in its scope and its firepower and in its might that is unsurpassed in human history. There's no empire that is as total and global as this one. It has over 700 major military bases. It has um, <clears throat> troops. It has troops in some 80 or 90 countries. Troops, American national troops. It, its fleets make port on every port, every continent in, in, in the globe. The U.S. spends more on military, uh, um, on the military than all other nations combined. Um, it's an empire, as you know, without colonies, really, in, in the old direct colonial rule sense. There's no Colonel Blimps and that sort of thing. Uh, and we call it neo-colonialism or neo-imperialism. Um, the third world countries have nominal independence. Uh, a, a prime example of that was what how the United States treated Cuba. After stealing Cuba from the Spaniards uh, in a war, the Americans turned to the Cubans in 1902 or so and they said, you know what, uh, we stole you fair and square from the Spaniards, um, but we are a republic and it doesn't look good that we have colonies, so we're gonna give you your independence. And that's the way we are. And, and, and American leaders felt so good about how generous they were in doing this, said, you're going to have your own president, you're going to have your own flag, in fact, we have it right here, uh, it's a, it'll be red, white, and blue, and you get only one star, though, because you're just a little island, you know, um, and uh, you're going to have your own currency, uh, you don't have to call it dollars, you can call them pesos if you want, and you can have Jose Marti on the peso. You don't have to have George Washington or any of our other slaveholders. Um, that's, that's American currency specializes in slaveholders. Almost every one of them, with the exception of Benjamin Franklin on the $50 bill, owned and dealt in slaves for the most part. Maybe Hamilton didn't either. Okay. <laughs> So he, uh, so we went to the Cubans and we said, and you're going to have your own constitution, and here that is too. We got that written up for you. Um, check the Spanish. You know, our Spanish isn't that good. Uh, and Cuba became an independent country, and all, all, all the American leaders, uh, political and economic leaders, all they settled for in return is that they would own and control Cuba's sugar industry and tobacco industry and nickel uh, mining and refinery and tourist industry and all of Cuba's relations with third countries, other countries. Um, so that's, that's what neo-imperialism is, where uh, you get the hulk, the shell of independence and, and, the, and the imperialists get the substance. Now... Where is it? Oh. Trying to 
get away, you little rascal, okay? Um, this, the, the thing that imperialism does is that it brings poverty throughout the world. It brings wealth to the few, and it brings poverty to the many. Um, You've got to make room. Okay. Um, and that fits in with the whole concept of capitalism as a, as a purveyor of prosperity. We've all heard this one time or another. You get it especially in the States um, that it's capitalism that has brought us out prosperity. You'll even hear people who are having a hard time, who are barely keeping their chin above water, saying that, oh, well, if it wasn't for the corporations, we wouldn't have jobs. And the corporations even call themselves job providers. Like Bank of America, you know, last, last uh, uh, couple of weeks ago, just laid off 30,000 people, bank providers. Well, capitalism brings prosperity. We've always been taught. We hear it all the time. I will now demonstrate to you in, in 15 seconds the contrary, okay? And it goes like this. One, most of the world is capitalist and most of the world is poor. I rest my case. Did I win the argument or not? <laughs> Two, in those parts of the world where capitalist investment has little or no regulation imposed on it, the populations are poorest. The investors enjoy the highest rate of value accumulation, highest return. The more free trade and free market the world becomes, the poorer it becomes. So the more capitalist it becomes, the poorer it becomes. And that's true of capitalist Indonesia, capitalist Guatemala, capitalist Mexico, capitalist Nigeria, and capitalist other countries. Okay, the same within the USA and Canada for that matter. The more free trade, the more free market, the more income inequality, the more economic hardship for the 99% and the more wealth for the 1%. Now this global empire has to be looked at a little more closely. Writers like Chalmers Johnson call it an empire of bases and of military dominion. That's why they now can talk about empire. They see it only as a matter of dominion, of power, you see. But it's more than that. First of all, the U.S. power extends to more than just bases. There's a global network of military and security forces. There are officer classes in many countries that are trained, advised, and equipped by the United States on the U.S. payroll. And they, and they develop an international camaraderie and they work with each other. I, I'm talking about military security forces, paramilitary, police, and even death squads for that matter. All finance equipped, trained, advised by the CIA uh, or the U.S. Pentagon and related agencies. In Africa, for instance, 50 nations not all at once, but at one time or another, 50 nations have received extensive military aid from the U.S. Now, there's only 53 nations in Africa, and 50 of them have gotten this kind of uh, military assistance. But empires are not just motivated by military power or power for power's sake. This is what we hear. They're not just run by control freaks, although having control freaks helps somewhat for, for the operation of things. The power is, is an instrument of empire. It's not the end all. The goal is to expropriate the wealth of the world. That's what it's there for. It's to take the money from and value from those who produce it. The subsidiary, the secondary goal, is to make the world safe for the expropriators. Uh, so one is to advance and, and, and allow that function to happen, and two is to protect it against those who might resist it. And therefore, empires do something that's very rarely, if you read the literature of empires, going back to ancient Rome too, it's very odd how many of these scholars are very admiring of empires, you know. Rome, in many of the movies we always see, remember those movies you see about ancient Rome? Rome, the senator will stand there, and everybody in the audience says, oh, Rome, you know. Um, uh, well, what was Rome? It, was, it expropriated, it, it, it took from the people, it, um, it, um, the, the goal is, the, the, the goal is to, is to really 
take from people. And w consequently, what the empire does, and this is what's left out of a lot of these movies and such, it kills a lot of people, enormous numbers of people. Millions upon millions have been killed in Africa in the 19th and in the 20th century. In Mozambique and, and Angola uh, alone, it was, over, it was over a million people killed in, in, since the 70s. Um, <clears throat> the goal is to prevent political leaders, movements, and nations from emerging and charting an alternative path. They don't have to even be communists or socialists. Just if they chart an, an alternative path, even if they just just if they commit the sin of economic nationalism, that could often be enough to go after them. U.S. rulers have attacked many countries in Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, Far East, Central Asia. Um, <clears throat> attacked them with trade wars, sanctions, financial strangulation, debt traps. Uh, death squads, invasions, direct and indirect. Um, <clears throat> any nation that tries to work outside the corporate transnational system, the New World Global Order, is called an enemy of America. Every nation that works inside is called friendly to America. And, and it's never explained why, what makes them anti or pro or whatever. Uh, <clears throat> This process whereby the ruling interests of the dominant country try to expropriate the land, the labor, the capital, the natural resources, and the markets of another country, that system of expropriation is known as imperialism. And a lot of the books that have been written since, the, since, 90, well, since 2000 will now mention empire. You know, you couldn't, in the U.S., you could not use the word empire with U.S. in front of it. You could not say the American empire. When I wrote a book back in 1995 called Against Empire, and I called the U.S. an empire, I had people come over and say, uh, isn't this a bit much? There you are, you're going overboard, uh, parenti again, you know. Uh, uh, America isn't an empire. This is a foreign policy you're looking at. I said, no, no, it's, a, it's, it's an empire. But nobody did that. When I was in grade school, we were taught that we don't have empires. America, the French had it, the British had it. America does not have empires. We have territories and we have possessions, they were called. But we did not have empire, bad boy. Don't you say that word again. So, um, imperialism is what empires do. Um, and that's why, by the way, I, 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 where was I? About, oh, this literature. 95, I wrote that book, Against Empire. By 2000, all sorts of books started coming out, written by Americans, using the word empire in their title, uh, Empire of Bases, uh, uh, The Sorrows of Empire, The Follies of Empire, The Twilight of Empire, The Dawn of Empire, uh, The Mid-Afternoon of Empire, <laughs> The Coffee Break for Empire, whatever it might be. <laughs> but the empire... And they were all talking about the U.S. I said, what's going on? Are they actually, are the liberals actually waking up and really getting it now? And then if you read these books closer, you find they don't mention imperialism. But that's what empires do. Empires do imperialism. And then you realize what they mean by empire is just simply dominion, power, control. And they don't get into the political economy of it. And if you would believe them, you would think that they're just these Washington planners who do all these things because they just got to do them to occupy themselves. And there's no political economic content to it, you see. Um, well, what I'm arguing that, in fact, imperialism is a process of expropriation of wealth. And the, and the protection of that system of expropriation. And that's what is often left out. And that's why they're able to use the term empire. Even some conservatives will start saying things like, we're, we're a superpower, we're an empire, and we've got to act like an empire, and we've got to get in there, and we've got to do this, and we've got to do that, and all that sort of thing, as if their power gave them automatic entitlement to act upon people in this way. 
Um, <clears throat> just talk among yourselves a minute so I can catch up on my notes as to where I am. <laughs> <laughs> Now, sometimes the people are skeptical says, you mean they go to all these countries and they do all this and they suppress it and they undermine their social programs in these countries and they undermine their environmental protections and they undermine their uh, independent capital and they undermine the, this and that and they take it all for themselves and they, and they roll back social services, they do all those things. Why would they do that? Why would they do that? They wouldn't do that. I said, what do you mean they wouldn't do that? They do it to, our, to us right here at home. That's exactly what they do. They roll back their social services and the like, and um, our social services and the same. And they create poverty uh, at, 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 so that they might enjoy greater wealth. Um, <clears throat> and that's the same thing they do here. These are today, in the US, I think more so than in Canada here, uh, these are pretty bad times for us. Uh, the level of income, in e income inequality is, is about 1929 now. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, level, the level of unemployment is the worst it's been since World War II. Uh, so it's sort of like almost getting close to Great Depression time. The level of underemployment, if they really did an honest figure, and not just take the people who are applying for unemployment, but there are many others who have dropped out. There are many others who are underemployed. There are many others who are working part time and who really, really want need need full time jobs. And there are many others who go in the army because they got nothing else nothing else going. The only thing they can do, uh, we, I, we I call that economic conscription. We have a volunteer army, but it's really a form of class conscription. Um, these bad times are not bad for everyone. They're not bad for the 1%, as you know. Recessions are not really such bad things for moneyed interests. In a recession, small competitors are bought up for bargain prices. Big capital squeezes out small capital. Labor unions are tamed and even broken. Labor itself is tamed, not your union organization, but one's own labor power, labor, labor efforts uh, you end up working harder for less pay at jobs that you would never have imagined that you would be doing. Uh, this recession really is a jobless recovery. Massive hardship along with record profits. Recessions also advance privatization, which is another dream goal of the reactionary right capitalist, uh, reactionary right wing of the capitalist uh, system. Um, as state and local governments lose revenues, they start selling off their resources, their natural resources, their regional parks, the public infrastructure like bridges, utilities, prisons, schools. They close other services. Um, Oakland, Oakland, California, you've heard about, you've heard about the, the Nazi movement in Oakland, they, also known as the Oakland police. They, um, <laughs> Well, you know, you look at Oakland. I live about eight blocks from the Oakland line. I live in South Berkeley in the flats there. Um, uh, and uh, you go to Oakland, and, and you go to the um, Occupy Oakland, and these police came out. You know, I swear there must have been somebody in the White House that sent word out, because this was happening in Chicago, Baltimore, Atlanta, a number of other places. Suddenly, last week, in the period of 48 hours, the police were confronting these demonstrators and were, getting, and were coming out in their combat, combat gear. You know what the combat gear is. Every city in America has federal funding for this combat gear. This is a city, Oakland, which is poor. It's so poor, the police announced that they would not enforce nonviolent crimes. So if your car is stolen, we don't come. If you see somebody breaking into your car and taking it and you call 911, we don't bother. We only come if it's murder, rape, or felonious assault, bodily assault on you now, uh, because we don't have the funding. And yet there they were in Oakland. Each cop has about $3,000 worth of equipment, his Darth Vader helmet, his, <laughs> his bulletproof chest, vest, you know, his, his taser, his... Uh, What's that? His mace gun, his his uh, 
his stunt, no, no, what's the, uh, the grenade, what's that called again? What? Percussion, percussion grenade. Percussion grenade. What the hell is a cop in civil society doing with a percussion grenade that he throws in at a group of people who are standing around because one man has almost been killed, Scott Olson, an ex, uh, ex-marine, hit in the head with a, with a tear gas canister. He still is unable to talk. He's still on critical list. And the people crowded around. And I saw it right on the internet now. People, we got our cameras, don't we? And, uh, mm-hmm. and thrown right in at him. Percussion grenades, automatic weapons, combat outfits. I mean, this is an impoverished, an impoverished police force, but when they can come out, a lazy-ass police force that resents calls that come in when it takes precious time away from their donuts and coffee, um, but, but they can be out there when they're serving their class masters and they can make war and act like an army, against, a one-sided fight against young people who have not armed with their knapsacks and pun, pup tents, you know, uh, and, and, and beating them up and go, going in on them like that. And that's what we got. The, the same city of Oakland is announcing that they're closing down 14 of their 18 libraries. You know, I was raised in, I was raised in New York City. I was... Uh, in, a, in a, a blue collar, a very poor neighborhood, East Harlem it was called, it was Italian American. Um, that, I, I remember being very poor, I was a street kid and all that. And you got a problem with that? No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I remember the library was like an oasis. The library was like a refuge. When I got tired of hanging around the pool room and the handball court and the street, I would go to the library once in a while not, not, not for any great intellectuality and all, because I, I did, had no idea of that, but I would just read. I would just read stuff because it would take me to all sorts of places. And, uh, and I, I, the library can make a difference. And here they're going to close down 14 libraries, a lot of them in neighborhoods where that's the only quiet place that kids will have uh, to, to study or think or get themselves going. So that's the way, that's the, that's the America I live in now. America the Beautiful. Um, in 1989, I gave a talk uh, at, uh, someplace in the, in the States, and that George Herbert Walker Bush, that's George W. Bush's daddy, was president in 1989. And I said, Bush wants, is, is embarking on the third worldization of America, and that's the goal. The third worldization of America, the real goal is the third worldization of everywhere, of the whole globe. This is what they want. They are rolling back the social democracy. They use the term social democracy. A member of the Business Council uh, during Jimmy Carter's day, I remember seeing this. It leaped up at me. He said, if we keep going with all these benefits and, and social programs and all, we'll have a social democracy. Meaning a place like Finland or Norway or this and that. Uh, yeah, yeah, and the gap between the rich and the poor, he mentioned it. The gap is low, closer and tighter than ever. This kind of thing has got to stop. I mean, and, but he used the term social democracy. Now, Americans don't use it. There's about, there's about 200 Americans who, who, who know that term, what it means, social democracy. It means these, these countries. You know, if, if, any, if they ever got close to it, they would say a welfare state or a term of that sort. Uh, which is sort of is a pejorative kind of term, as it's used in the States. Well, they got Ronald Reagan in, and he started rolling it back and rolling it back. You know, when George Bush left office, I was reading in The New Yorker, let's fast forward 30 years later, and I'm reading in, in 2008, and there's a, a, a Republican Party, RNC, Republican National Committee uh, operative, and he's saying, well, we've pretty much won everything. We've pretty much stripped this country of its social democracy. And again, the term leaked out that these, you see, these guys pretend to an ideological neutrality that they don't really have. They, um, but, but to see them use this term, to, to see that they have this ideological class consciousness that the American plutocracy seldom wishes to reveal, but uh, certain times they admit that this is what the fight is exactly about. And George Bush himself got up and said, I think my administration was a success. And he is goddamn right, he's right. 
I don't care how many of our liberal friends rocked back on their heels and said, he's so stupid and so stupid. The liberals never, never get tired of, of, of talking about how stupid George Bush was. And meanwhile, he's sticking it to them up one side and down the other. Cut back on environmental protections, cut back on health services, cut back on any decent thing you can think of. Doubled the military budget. More than doubled the debt as another way to strangle and, and beat us. And all the while they're calling him stupid because he mispronounces a few words. Big deal. And they did the same thing with Reagan. Um, so this is the kind of uh, underdevelopment we, we face here. Um, they don't want a country made up of people who are intelligent, informed, and articulate. They don't want a country that's well-educated, that has a sense of entitlement, and that has a high level of expectation for themselves and their children. They want you poor. The poorer and hungrier they can make you, the harder they can make you work for less and less. So get your nose back onto the grindstone. That's really what their message is. Um, <clears throat> I started to say about Bush. Bush said, when he left, he said, my administration was successful. The one failure I had was I couldn't get rid of Social Security. Now there too, is these moments of honesty, these little flickers of honesty that comes out of a, a mouth that was made for lies, you see. Uh, it's, it, it, was, it was, I thought, pretty interesting. They oppose Social Security not because it doesn't work, not because it's going broke. It runs a surplus of many billions of dollars every year. And they could take care of that whole demographic shift by just lifting the, the ceiling on what part of your, the income is taxable and such. Uh, they, they oppose Social Security because it does work. It, it's, it's, it's a socialist program. It's, it's, um, it's the United States' most successful anti-poverty program. It leaves much to be desired. There's, I mean, there are people who just barely struggle and barely survive on Social Security, but it's the only thing that's keeping them from sleeping under the bridges. I heard Robert Reich not long ago. He was talking about the economic recession, and he said, things aren't going right. Uh, the country isn't doing this right. Jobless recovery, record profits and wealth accumulation, um, and all that. And he said, it's too bad, he said, it's too bad that we can't find somebody in Washington with half a brain who could take care of this. The stupidity level is great. And the audience all laughed again. And you see, you're being stupid, Robert Reich, even though he gave a very good rundown of everything that was wrong, to then say, to ascribe it to stupidity. Why is that stupidity? They're getting what they want. The income differential, the gap between the rich and the poor is getting wider and wider. The social democracy is, is, is disappearing. So why, why, and the same with foreign policy, the same thing. When I, we used to hear that, why is US foreign policy so stupid? In my book, The, um, uh, the Face of Imperialism, I have a whole section and I gathered together all the kinds of adjectives that the liberal critics use about U.S. foreign policy. It's inept, it's reckless, it's misguided, it's overreaching, it's arrogant, deluded, aggrandizing, messianic, misplaced. Robert Cohen. Robert Cohen can write. He has a, he's had a column for some 25 years now in the Washington Post. And here's how Robert Cohen can become a columnist for the Washington Post. And here's why you can't become a columnist for the Washington Post. And this was a compliment I'm giving you when I say that. He writes as follows back in 2005. The Iraq war is not the product of oil avarice or CIA evil. And we don't say it is, although those may be factors that come into the equation. But it is a problem of a surfite of altruism, a naive compulsion to do good. And who does he mention as suffering from this, uh, uh, this compulsion to do good? George Bush, Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, Paul Wolfowitz. Uh, these are the compulsive 
do-gooders. Now, <laughs> you see, what it is is, is when, when, you, when you gather together this enormous amount of evidence of all these things that are going wrong, you then have to start linking and connecting the dots. If you do that, you start developing, you start moving from a liberal complaint about how bad things are to a radical analysis of why it operates this way. And so they don't do that. Instead, they look at all this and they say, what a mess, what stupid inept people we have in Washington, overextending themselves and the like. In fact, what I argue in, the, in that book, The Face of Imperialism, I argue, which by the way is a short book, it has a virtue of brevity. Um, <laughs> most books are too long. Um, including the Bible and volume one of Capital. And <laughs> <laughs> I argue that the US empire builders are very rational. They're very successful. They know what they're doing. They consistently, consistently support those dictators or democratically elected governments that follow the new world order of free market capitalism. They consistently, consistently oppose those dictators or democratic governments, movements, people, whatever, that seek an alternative to free market capitalism, that seek economic self-development, communal development, and that's true of the, the New Jewel movement in Grenada. The Gaddafi's real sins in Libya was that he would not bring the IMF in. He, he did that, he built that aquifer system which brought that fresh water up to the north where most of the people of Libya live, fresh water for the farms and for themselves. Um, he, he kicked the oil companies out and he took the earnings from those oil companies and he built free housing for the Libyan people free education uh, and free health care. Uh, whatever else he did, whatever his other sins were, that isn't what the West was concerned. They, didn't, they weren't concerned about that. Look, right next door to him was another dictator, Mubarak. And right down almost to the last day, Obama and Hillary were defending Mubarak. For 30 years I heard about Mubarak in Egypt and all I ever heard him referred to in the U.S. media was President Mubarak. President Mubarak was well, one of the most repressive, repressive regimes, but he was President Mubarak, whereas Gaddafi was, uh, you know, commander or dictator or, or whatever else like that. Milosevic of Yugoslavia, who could not get convicted by, the, by that uh, tribunal um, in, um, in The Hague. It wasn't the World Court. It's just that trumped-up tribunal that the British and the Americans set up to, to, to try him. When the top jurist in the, in the Hague, uh, Carla del, del Ponte said, two years of prosecution, we don't have a case against this guy. We, we, there's nothing we can put him in jail about. There were no mass slaughters. There were no 100,000 bodies buried in Kosovo. You took over Kosovo. Where are the bodies and all? But that kind of stuff was pumped out, and we had people, even progressives, and even people who consider themselves on the left, there they were standing shoulder to shoulder with the CIA, and the Pentagon and NATO and the very same mass media they always tell us don't believe and take it with a grain of salt and look, watch what you're reading and all that and there they were standing shoulder to shoulder with them fighting the whatever it was the last Stalinist whatever they thought he was um, democratically elected in Yugoslavia in Yugoslavia's first democratic election Noriega of Panama Chavez of Venezuela is called the firebrand uh, a barracks populist, whatever that's supposed to mean, and such, uh, and not and hostile to America. Aristide in Haiti, de twice democratically elected and, and, and disposed by the U.S. and driven out of his own country. Allende in Chile, killed. S uh, Zelaya in Honduras, um, whom, Obama, whom Obama sold right down the river. Because, and what it was Zelaya's sin? in Honduras. He wanted to raise the minimum wage by about 10 cents an hour. And, and the military went against him and kicked him out. And you can go on and on with, the, with these things. Um, 
Saddam Hussein is a very interesting case. There's your control group if you want to experiment. When Saddam Hussein was CIA. You know, back in, back in the late 50s, early 60s, Iraq had, a, had this revolution and had this democratically elected coalition government. Um, and Saddam Hussein's first gig under the CIA was to go and murder the prime minister, the democratically elected prime minister of Iraq. And today when they go in, when they go in and say, we, we, we come to Iraq to teach these, these poor little backwood people how to run a democracy. They forget they had a democracy 20 years before. This is a 5,000 year civilization. We're going to come in and, and teach them uh, how to really survive and tie their shoelaces and that sort of thing. Uh, okay, within, within about 10 years, they got Saddam Hussein to head the Ba'athist party with enough killings, with enough money, with enough recruitment of strong arms and such. And he came into office, and, and Saddam Hussein came into office. He murdered or drove into exile or drove underground every constitutionalist, every democrat, every communist, every socialist, every reformer in Iraq. That's what he did. And when he was doing that, some of the most horrible tortures and murders. He was Washington's poster boy. They loved him. They couldn't get enough of him. They take their pictures with him. They sent him aid. They signed him into war against Iran. They gave him special uh, this and special that and all that. Then he started doing some very funny and unforgivable things. Do you know what he did? He committed economic nationalism. He refused to privatize everything. He kept the entire economy state-owned. Donald Rumsfeld, Secretary of Defense, U.S., said, it looks like a Stalinist economy. I was amused by the use of that term. <laughs> a, a Stalinist economy. He kept everything national. He started educating engineers, cadres. Women were going to school. He kept a lot of the reforms of the former democracy. And they were saying, hey, why don't we kill all these people and jack, jack them in there when he's doing, carrying out some of the same programs that they had. And he refused to give the oil com companies back their oil. Their oil, which the Iraqis very inconsiderately and selfishly had buried in their own ground. Which, which was... so, um, so what did they do? They bombed him and they destroyed him and the like. But, but isn't that interesting? Now here you're controlling for the very same person. And you see, if, he, if he's doing these set of actions, which I said are called friendship, pro-American, uh, democratic, healthy, it's, it's okay, and when, he, when he does these sets of actions. And in fact, in the second stage, he did much less murdering and killing, uh, and, and re relatively little. It, it only, he was like improving himself, and, and, and who the hell wants that as, a, as your ally? What use is that? Is he going soft on us? <clears throat> well, how do the American builders get the American people, American empire builders, how do they get the American people to go along with all of this? Um, no jokes from you Canadians now, okay? Let, let, let me just uh, talk about, uh, about uh, no, I know that there's a great show, it, kind of, it used to be, one of its segments was called uh, Talking with Americans. Do you know the, the show? I mean, I forget the guy's name. And they used to, they used to, and you, you, you heartless Canadians used to come down to the US and, and used to interview Americans about things, you know? I think they even interviewed, uh, they interviewed President George Bush himself. They said, they said oh, oh, oh um, um, President Bush, uh, the Canadian president, already a joke, the Canadian president, Tim Horton, uh, sends his regards. <laughs> and Bush said, oh, oh, say hello to President Horton for me. Oh, <laughs> I haven't seen him in quite a while, yeah. <laughs> And then they did a survey, they went around, they went around, they, they said to Americans, you know, you know the Canadians are killing all of our silverfish. You know what silverfish are? These like little roaches that you find in the bathtub, you're, you're supposed to whack them, and they're vermin. And people say, oh, we gotta stop them from doing that. <laughs> so I love the show, but, um, <laughs> but it's pretty bad when the Empire does it, you know, and plays tricks. Uh, um, 
Mostly, mostly, it, there are messianic appeals to we're, we are God's gift to humanity and we've got to help and we've got to do this and we have the power, therefore we have the responsibility. There's that kind of talk. And Americans really don't bite at that that much, really. Uh, but in fact, the thing that works is using the fear, convincing them that they are beset by enemies and political demons from abroad and they are in danger. And that's what, hap that's what happened with Saddam Hussein when they decided they were going to destroy him. And the, and the polls were showing like 75, 80 percent of Americans were against committing American troops in Kuwait and the first Gulf War and all that. They said, why the hell we should go there? I'm, I, I'm not going to support some war like that. I'm worried about paying my rent and keeping my job. What's this all about? Well, um, then they started saying, what if Saddam Hussein has nuclear weapons? The phrase weapons of mass destruction had not yet come into vogue in 1991. They said nuclear weapons, which he might use. Well, you know, it's like saying, uh, what if someone has a gun to your head? Are you going to feel comfortable about it or what? So then, if you can incite enough people with, with fear that, and, you know, that their homes are in, in danger, their children are in danger and all that, then they are willing to hand over their tax dollars and their, and their rights to the... Uh, to those who would wage wars. For years we saw that, I was raised in that, it was called uh, saving the world from communism. Communism everywhere, communism in schools, communism in Hollywood, communism uh, under your bed, your mama, communism going to get your mama, you know. Uh, you got to worry about communism. And, uh, and we lived in this fear of the ruthless, power-hungry communists who were overthrown after a few demonstrations and there was a panicky period in the early to mid-90s where the plutocracy and the global empire builders who had said, we need this enormous budget, we need these global empire, we need all these bases to contain the Soviet Union. Well, the Soviet Union was gone now. It's very rare when history operates like a laboratory experiment. You know, you can, you can remove the one, uh, have a control and remove the... the uh, um, the one vital component or ingredient and then retest it without that. But there it was, it was gone. And you know what happened? The U.S. military budget went, grew at a faster rate than ever. The number of military bases increased at a faster rate than ever. We now have bases, major bases in Kyrgyzstan, in Central Asia, where 15 years ago no American policymaker even dreamed that we could have a base there. And now we got bases there. Well, that was part of, that was a part of the Soviet Union. Uh, it isn't. So, so there it is. So, so, what, so here's the danger now. We've run out of enemies. What do we do? How do we keep the American people frightened enough? And thank God it came along the war on terror. Now the war on terror had been going on before. It was always ascribed to the Soviets. A world network of terrorism with its headquarters in Moscow was the phrase that Claire Rising was always using. I, I don't know if you remember her. Um, no, not Claire Rising, I'm sorry. I don't, I, I think I had the wrong name there. Strike that. Edit, <laughs> edit this film now. There. <clears throat> well, the imperialists cannot tell the American public that we want you to die for the free market. Die to make the world safe for the Fortune 500 and the super rich. So they say they're involved, they go in because of humanitarian considerations or to ward off an aggressor or defend our national security, to free a country from a tyrant, to fight terrorism and all that stuff. Uh, <clears throat> and since the, since the end of Soviet Union, since then the U.S. has invaded Panama, they've invaded Haiti, they've invaded Somalia, they destroyed Yugoslavia, they invaded Afghanistan, they invaded and occupied Iraq and have destroyed it for the most part. They're destroying Libya, another, which will soon probably emerge as another militant extremist uh, Islamic base. Um, <clears throat> the empire sees only two types of states beyond its borders. I, I, I discuss this in the book too. Vassal states, or what we often call client states or satellites, um, and that includes our allies. With allies, of course, you give them a little more room, but they go along pretty much 
or they never interfere with us if we're going to bomb a country in Europe. Whoever knew that uh, a country in Europe was going to be destroyed by aerial war? That's Yugoslavia. Um, and they went along, they looked the other way. Some of them and others actually participated. Um, or the other kind of state is an enemy state or potential enemy. Every state that is not a, a vassal or a satellite of the U.S. empire is potentially an enemy. Some of them just because of their sheer size. They cannot be that readily bludgeoned. Russia would be an example. Also because they have nuclear weapons and therefore we can't bomb them as we can bomb Libya as we will be bombing Iran soon, which I think they would have been doing by now if it weren't for the Arab Spring and all that agitation that had been going on. So think of that when, when you do demonstrations, does it have any effect or impact? It does deter them, it does give them uh, moments of uh, hesitations and, and such. Um, and China is another example of a country. China is about the only country in the world that's not afraid of the United States. And they make it known now, you know. I mean, when, when you got a trillion dollar debt note on, on the U.S., when you're outproducing, when, when the U.S. economy is at zero growth and you're, you're, you're doing 8%, although that bubble may burst, because capitalism has its wastes and irrationalities, even in a controlled situation, relatively controlled situation like China. Um, the Chinese don't have a single soldier on foreign soil, remember that. They have troops in Tibet. They've had troops in Tibet for a thousand years, by the way. They don't see this as, as a, a sudden aggrandizement or anything like that. And the Tibetan ruling elites always welcomed the Chinese, a Mongolian, it was a Mongolian Chinese troop, troop force. What they didn't like about the last one in 52 was that it was communist and, that made, and it wanted reforms like land reform, the end of slavery, and the end of serfdom. And that didn't sit well at all with the religious and secular elites of Tibet. But China doesn't have bases all over the world. It doesn't have fleets going everywhere. And, and, and they're not afraid of the Americans. They say, so you got 300 million? We got, we got 1.2 billion people. So you got nuclear weapons? Well, we got nuclear weapons too, and we got them targeted, you know, and they, they get let loose like yours can get let loose. Uh, that, during that dispute in the China South Sea there, you know, with China, and Malaysia and Taiwan and uh, Vietnam are all arguing about the oil reserves and the US came along and said, we will give our good offices and adjudicate this thing. And the Chinese said, who the hell ask you? you know, <laughs> get the hell out of here. You have no historic claim or link here. Just get out of here. And, and that was that. It was very interesting. You look in Africa now, you know, the U.S. corporations go in and their goal is to do what? Destroy all the communal farming, destroy whatever they can, grab, all the, grab everything they can and get the hell out, leave the people poor and, get, and, and, leave, and go out rich. The Chinese come in and they say, what? You, what do you need? Improvements in your port? We'll do the improvements. What do you need? Some roads here, there? We'll build them for you. you now give us a contract on your, on, on, on your minerals and such and the like. And they're very popular in some parts of Africa. So, so China is a potential enemy. And when Obama gets up and does his State of the Union, he starts with our, our, our rivalry with China. And I said, wait a minute, who's right? I, I got no rivalry with China. I'm not in no race against the Chinese. I'm not, uh, what is this? What is this stuff you see? Let me, let me just make two last points and I'll stop. Um, maybe three. Um, the empire feeds off the republic. The empire gets its immense wealth. It's a very costly affair to, to police the whole world. And, um, and, and um, the global military power is stronger than ever. The Pentagon is stronger than ever. And the republic is poorer and more depleted than ever. You have, in, as, we, as I've already said, indebted states and municipalities and such, closing hospitals, closing schools, and libraries. And this, there's a number of books written about how the US empire is in decline. I don't see that. Did I miss something? I don't see it as in decline. The republic is in decline. I mean, that's for sure. And you shouldn't confuse the two. Uh, there's, um, now there's whole-scale whole resistance. But um, it is also true that the empire, like any parasite, can kill its host if it feeds and feeds and feeds. 
the republic if the republic collapses the empire doesn't get um, doesn't get enough um, but um, <clears throat> what to do well I think the alternative is socialism oh come on didn't socialism have its day what are you talking about well stop thinking about socialism and commun uh, and capitalism as two great epic armies that have somehow clashed and socialism has been uh, shattered and ca capitalism rules supreme around the world. There is no alternative. That's the way they want you to think about it. But just look around in your own society, even in the US, which where you have whole populations who, who begin to shake and, and you know go crazy if they hear the word socialism. I remember a, work, a, a worker that I knew up in Vermont, and I showed, we had a, a, a party called the Liberty Union Party back in the early 70s. I ran for Congress in Vermont. The guy on our ticket who ran for the Senate was named uh, Bernie Sanders, and he's now a senator from Vermont. I mean, he, he then later became mayor of Burlington and then congressman and then senator. It has only one congressman from a small state. But there was a, and I knew this guy well, and I showed, look, this is the program. This is everything we'd want to go, and he's looking, reading, reading, reading. He said, this is terrific. The only thing I don't like is this last line. You say, this will bring us to socialism. I don't like, so I don't want any socialism. He wanted all the substance of socialism, but he didn't want the word, you know, because he was trained, they salivate negatively when they hear the bell, socialism. And I want socialism because it does work. It may not work in everything, in every kind of area. There are certain kinds of specialty services and such where you don't want the state running, like you may not want the state running the plumbing industry, so you wait three, three days for a plumber to come. Um, um, I'm thinking about Cuba right now. But socialism has worked. Healthcare, healthcare is better than the socialism. The French healthcare, the Finnish uh, healthcare, Swedish healthcare, much better than the U.S. healthcare. That was education, the socialism. Um, I taught at the State University of New York many years ago. I'm a recovering academic. I tell people now, <laughs> but uh, I taught there, and I remember students saying, uh, "But what would socialism do? How does it work? I can't even imagine it." I said, "You can't imagine it. You're sitting in it right now. This this, this university is socialist." It's not run for a profit. It's run by the community. It's run by public funding. And, and utilities, pub, the publicly owned utilities in America are better run. They, the money they earn goes into the public budget. It doesn't go into private pockets of big plutocrats. We have private utilities in some areas. We have public utilities. I live in Northern California where you have the biggest, most powerful private utility. It's called Pacific and Gas Pacific Gas Electric, what is it, PG&E, PG&E, um, and we pay the highest rates in the country, we, and it's a private company. So you pay more and you get more dangerous service. It's the same company that gave us the San Bruno explosions just about five, ten miles from where I live, uh, at which killed eight people and destroyed about 40 homes, just blew them away. In, in midday, when luckily no, not that many people were home, only eight were killed and such. Um, and there's investigations of it and all that, but PG&E is still there. So I, I want socialism, it can save lives and the like. Transportation, public transportation is always better. The one, the one state in the U.S. that had a relatively more stable and less a, a, a drastic uh, economic financial recession was North Dakota. And North Dakota is the only state in the union that has state banks. So that, that, that means the public funds and all this money, these millions of dollars, go into a state bank and they earn, they earn money not for the rich bankers but for the, for the public itself. Um, <clears throat> when public programs don't work, it's usually because they're defunded and they're deprived of enough money to really be ca to carry out the work that they could do. So there we are. The Occupy movement that we see today is most explicitly ideologically advanced. I think it's terrific. It's a, it's a very good movement. The signs say things like, you know, down with capitalism, or we can't afford capitalism, and we need socialism, 
and talk about the 1% and the 99%, that's a devilishly clever and simple thing to finally do, just the 1%. You know, it's not even 1%. I mean, 1% of the U.S. population is over 3 million people. The super rich are really about, there's about 240,000 individuals, and they, and they really are super rich. If you look at the chart and how the income goes, when you get to that last fraction, it's about a fra .0004, it's like a fraction of 1%. It shoots up, it would shoot up into the stratosphere, beyond this ceiling. Uh, if, if, you made, if I made a chart on the board, it, you, you could not, it would take weeks and days and helicopters and, 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 uh, and everything to get it all the way up to the top. No, it's really true. I saw an article in the New York Times about the rich and what they're doing and all that, and, and they show this house, very nice house. I said, that's not the rich. That's not the super rich. That's not who owns America and most of the world. That's not the group that has $1.2 trillion in personal wealth. I said, that's, that's not them. Um, houses like that, I can go from my, my little cottage all the way up the hill, up to the hills in East Berkeley, and I can find houses like that. And, um, and they'll go for a million dollars a million and a half, but that's not the super rich. Even, even when they talk about the rich, they have no idea how rich the rich really are. The rich live in homes that you can't take pictures of, unless you're up in a press helicopter and you shoot from that. Otherwise, you know, you'll be, you'll be shot by the guards or the security forcing. They live on estates and the like. So we've got to become aware of the extent to which these things happen and the Occupy actions are excellent. We have to move to demonstrations. Demonstrations are important. They highlight issues that have long been buried. They mobilize numbers. They give a show of strength. In other words, they give a show of muscle to an opinion, to a stance. See, the media do not only control opinions. In fact, they don't con always control opinions, but they control opinion visibility. And so that becomes the frustration that our opinion gets no visibility. And what's happened, we have suddenly broken through that cloud to some degree. And of course, they're still obfuscating it and trivializing it and snickering at it and, and the like, which is what their job is to do, the, the corporate media. That's why they work for the corporate media. Um, but demonstrations should also evolve into other forms of action, civil disobedience, organizing unions and such. It's a wonderful, one of the wonderful aspects of the Occupy movement is those places where unions have come in. Workers, teamsters, nurses, teachers have moved in and, and, uh, and, and lent support and sometimes financial support too. Refusal to serve in the armed forces, that's a weak point of the empire. The empire has a, a manpower shortage, which is, that's why Obama goes waxes ecstatic over the drones, like you can kill people without risking any American lives, they just go <laughs> automatically, and they can shoot and wipe out villages, you know. All right, so they, there's some collateral damage and the like. We need new electoral strategies, we need a constitutional convention so that we can have an egalitarian democracy and not a rigmarole, obstacle course democracy. If you ever take American government, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, we need ideological education. We really have to advance the ideological consciousness. And that means when you see these things and you see how they come together, you can connect them and you can see why it's not just all confusion and buzzing, booming, blooming uh, 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 chaos, why in fact there are real consistencies there and, you, and you're able to organize this data into a real analysis. Um, and I hope I gave you some bit of a real analysis tonight. Thank you for being so courteous. Everybody.